And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Well, the title of my message today is Speak Life. Pretty simple. I want to talk to you today about the power of your words. You know, I've been a pastor for over eight and a half years, and I've been a communicator, and, you know, I've had lots of blunders over the past eight and a half years in talking, and let's just pray that none of those happen today, Um, but we'll see. Um, But I just thought it would be kind of fun to share about some other people who have publicly uh, had some blunders uh, in their communication and their words. How many of you guys like KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken? Yeah, they have a tagline called Finger Licking Good. I'm sure some of you have, have experienced that. Well, you know, in China, uh, when it came out, uh, Finger Licking Good actually means eat my fingers off. So I'm not sure how many Chinese people were at that time were running over to KFC, you know, to have some chicken. Um, in um, Coca-Cola, when they first came out, the Chinese translation of Coca-Cola was bite the wax tadpole. I'm going to go drink a can of bite the wax tadpole. No, I mean, that just that doesn't work. The last one is uh, President Jimmy Carter famously gave a speech in 1977 in Poland. At the end of his speech, he said, I have come to understand your desires for the future. That's a pretty good closing, closing statement. Well, the Polish translation of that is, I desire the Polish people carnally. (laughs) So, (laughs) words. We got to love words. You know, I have learned that if we want to live in a place of victory, We have to harness the power of our words. Your words can make you hireable or can make you fireable. Your words can bring you friends or cause friends to leave you. Your your words can push your children towards you or they can push your children away from you. Your words can bring prosperity or they can bring trouble. Your words can also cause you to see life through a different perspective in a way in which you view it, or your words can allow you to speak what the Word of God has to say. Our words. Today we're going to head in the direction of looking at our words in relation to our perspective. The Bible has a lot to say about words. You know, Proverbs is mostly the wisdom chapter. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. But what I've learned is that there's over 120 verses that talk about words. That shows me that words are important to God, so they should be important to me. We have a statement for you. I'm sure you've seen this uh, quote before, but it says, Watch your thoughts because they become your words. Watch your words because they're going to become your actions. Watch your actions because they'll become your habits. Watch your habits because that will become your character. And watch your character because that will become your destiny. You know, we think 60,000 thoughts a day. If you break that down, that is 35 to 48 thoughts a minute. Just think about that, right? Well, well, yeah, think about the thoughts that you're thinking right now. So in this 30-minute teaching, we'll see, you're going to think 1,440 thoughts So if we took everyone in this room and said, you know, 200 or or so, we would be over 300,000 thoughts that we are all thinking in this next 30 minutes. I can't even think about that. But uh, we speak 16,000 words a day. In a week, that would fill a 300-page book. In a year, that would fill an entire bookcase. And in your lifetime, that would fill an entire library. So I have three questions for you. How many of those words really matter? How many of those words make a difference? And how many of those words spoken speak life into your situations or have spoken death? You know, it says in Proverbs 18.21, the tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it are going to eat its fruit. 
It says in the NLT version, the tongue can bring life and death. Those who love it, love to talk, will reap the consequences. Our thoughts are powerful, and you know why? Because our thoughts are going to determine our future. Our thoughts are going to determine our next minute, our next hour. Have you ever heard the saying, oh, it's just all in your mind. It's all in your mind. Well, it really is because our successes and our victories begin in our mind. You know, you can think yourself into a mess or you can think yourself into a place of victory. And I want to think myself into a place of victory. But the mind is one of the hardest areas (laughs) to control. You know why? Because we have an enemy and he wants to come in and he wants to cause us to believe lies. He wants to come in and kill, steal, and destroy. And he wants to begin with the thoughts. Our mind is a playground to him if we let it be. And he wants to kill and destroy because he knows that next word that's going to come out of your mouth is either going to be life or it's going to be death. And if it is death, hold on because he's going to take you for a ride. First Peter 5, 8 tells us to stay alert. Watch out for that great enemy, the devil, because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have to guard ourselves. And what are two ways that we learn to guard ourselves? We have to believe that God's word is for us. Do you today believe that God's word is for you? I don't need those notes. Number two, we have to hear ourselves saying what we believe. So if my God is for me, who can be against me? So let's say that my God is for me. Who can be against me? It's so important that we hear ourselves speaking his word. Today, our text we're going to get into is going to be first Kings chapter 17 verses eight through 24. We will have that up here on the screens for you. And you can also look in your tablet or your phone or your Bible. The scripture starts here under the reign of King Ahab. It says in 1 Kings 16.33 that Ahab did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any other king. Mm. And at this time, Israel is in the midst of a drought. And we have a prophet whose name is Elijah. The Lord knows that Elijah is going to need some food and he's going to need some water in this drought. And we see in verses one through seven, how the Lord takes care of Elisha. He takes him to the brook Cherith at the brook there. He's able to drink some water. And also we see that the Lord sends ravens to bring food to feed Elisha. Number one, God's ways are not our ways. (laughs) Sometimes we just got to get rid of our own stinking thinking. And we serve the God (laughs) who can supply all of our needs in his way, not according to our way. So we see this bird and he's coming and he's feeding Elijah with his bread. And, you know, I kind of think that maybe this was the first fast food delivery service. I don't know. It could be where Wingstop got its name. (laughs) I don't know. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was my husband. I worked a while to deliver it because I couldn't say it like he said it. So I'm just so real, you guys. Okay? This is me. Anyways, so, but Elisha is being fed by these ravens, and he's being fed this bread. And um, so you, we start off now in verse 8. And what happened is that the brook has dried up. There's no more water. Thank you. And um, so let's go ahead and start reading in uh, uh, verse 8 here. It says, Then the Lord said to Elisha, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. Okay, after, you know, I've just been fed by ravens, I won't be surprised by anything. Okay, so God has said, I have a widow who's going to feed you in Zarephath. But number one, you're not just going to stay there for for a few hours. I want you to go and I want you to live there. 
So what do I see here? I see that I believe that where the Lord leads you, he's going to feed you. And where he guides you, he is going to provide for you. Because we see that with Elisha. He led him to the brook. Now he's leading him to this widow. Let's go on in verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. He arrived at the gates of the village. He saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water and a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her. Hey, bring me a bite of bread too. Hmm. But she said, I swear by the Lord, your God, that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I will die. Hmm. Point one, what do I see? Your perspective will influence your words. This woman didn't even have any sticks at her house. This woman had no resources. She was a widow. She had a little bit of oil left in her jar. And she's out and she's decided, I'm going to cook this last meal. And then my son and I were going to starve to death. That was her perspective. That is where she had come to in life. And you know, we can only go as far in life as our words are going to dictate, as our thoughts are going to take us. Her perspective was that I will eat it, I will die. We see the state of her heart in this passage. She's carrying a perspective of death. It says in Luke 64, Luke 6, 45, sorry, out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. So number one, your perspective will influence your words. Let's keep reading. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Stop. Don't be afraid. I think some of you need to hear that this morning. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said. But first, (laughs) think a little bit for me. Oh, Wow, okay, Elijah, who do you think you are? (gasps) He's a man of God. He's speaking what God has called him to speak. Sometimes, (laughs) as we're going along our way, God might whisper something to your heart. And you might be like, God, really? You want me to say that? You want me to do that? Yes. Trust him. Walk in him. Believe in him. He has a plan and a purpose for it. For this is what, wait, yeah, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops go again. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers. Point two, your words have the power to bring hope and bring life. Who are you bringing hope and life to today? You know, we see two totally different perspectives. We see this woman's perspective is a perspective full of death. I'm going to gather this, I'm going to cook it, and I'm going to die. But then we see in the same story, Elisha's perspective. And Elisha is carrying a God-sized perspective in his heart. He is doing what God has called him to do and told him to do. And his words tell her, don't be afraid. You're always going to have enough because that is the God that we serve today. So don't be afraid. You're always going to have enough. It's just, what is your perspective? Hmm. Is there a situation in your life right now where your perspective is directing the words that you're speaking? Is it possibly a job? Is there some relationship issues? Is it a family issue? Are you frustrated? Do you find yourself complaining? Do you find yourself talking more negative than you do positive in speaking the word of God? God desires to come in today and to give you a God-sized perspective He doesn't want to leave you here today with a stinking thinking and only looking and seeing yourself picking up a few sticks. He wants to see you walking out that abundant life. 
But it all starts in our minds. So verse 15. So she did as Elisha said, and she and Elisha and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the jar, just as the Lord had promised through Elisha. You know, the Bible has over 7,000 promises for you and for me. Promises that we will succeed. Promises that we can have confidence in him. Promises of health, of prosperity, of strength, of wisdom. If you need a promise, just go to the word of God. Promises that we don't have to fear and we don't have to be afraid. And why does God have so many promises? Because God wants us to learn to trust him. The moment you were saved, you had to believe on him, right? (laughs) You had to trust in his blood and what he did for us on Calvary. Well, he wants us to continue that journey. But again, I talked about we have an enemy who roams around like a roaring lion wanting to kill, steal, and destroy. So we have to keep our guard, guard up. We have to put on the full armor of God. And we have to be mindful of these things. Because sometimes we can get stuck in our own thoughts and we don't even know what we're thinking because we believe the lie for so long. And God wants to set you free of that. So verse 17. I found this to be interesting. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse. And finally he died. Then she said to Elisha, Oh, man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? Hmm. You know, your words are only going to go as far as your opinion of God. I'll say it again. Your words will only go as far as your opinion of God. This woman here is speaking negative words due to her situation. And you know what? I think about another situation in the Bible. I think about Paul and Silas. (laughs) Paul and Silas have been beaten and they have been thrown in jail. And the word doesn't say that Paul and Silas sit there and start complaining to each other and talking negative about their circumstances. But you know what the word of God says that Paul and Silas do? They start worshiping their God. Hallelujah. They worship him in the midnight hour. They worship him despite the shackles on their feet, despite the bruises on their body, despite the circumstances that they are in. They just start worshiping him. And as they worship him, whoo, those shackles fell off. Those shackles fell off. Mm. I think sometimes we just got to get away and we just have to worship him. We just have to worship him. Worship God with the words. Speaking life. Mm. You know, who is God to you today? That's a good question. Who is God to you today? Is he your healer? Is he your provider? Is he your strength? Is he that friend that sticks closer than a brother? Is he the one that's going to supply all of your needs? Who is God to you today? What is your opinion of God? Let's keep reading verse 19. But Elijah replied, he said, give me your son And he took the child's body from her arms and he carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying and he laid the body on his bed. I see here that sometimes we have to take our situation away from negative words. He had to get away from this woman, get away from her negative words. Then Elisha cries out to the Lord, oh Lord, my God. Why have you brought tragedy to this widow who's opened up her home to me, causing her son to die? So, you know, Elisha doesn't understand, and we see that here. But what I love is that Elisha's not complaining or talking negatively, but instead he goes right to God. How many times (laughs) does it just feel good (laughs) to complain? It feels good to talk negative. To say, you know, I shouldn't gossip, but, you know, it feels good just to say it. That's not what Elisha did. No. Elisha got away from that. He went up to the room and he started praying. Mm. We just got to go and worship God 
and just start praying sometimes and get away. Get away. So verse 21, he stretches himself out over the child three times. He cries out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elisha's prayer. Amen. God hears our prayers. If you don't think he hears your prayers, he hears your prayers today. And the life of the child returned and he revived. God wants to bring some dead things to life today. Mm. I just got that. God wants to bring some dead things to life. In the name of Jesus. Then Elisha brought him down from the upper room and he gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Verse 24. Then the woman told Elisha, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. What I love here is that through this drought, the Lord aligned Elisha's steps with the widow's steps because the Lord saw the widow. The Lord saw her son. The Lord cares about them. And God desired to do a work in that widow to show him, to show who he is, his glory, his awesomeness, to have the woman see who God is. Cause at the beginning she said, you're God. <laughs> That's your God. (laughs) But God came in. He showed up and he showed off. And I just believe today, I believe today that God is aligning your footsteps (laughs) with his destiny with his purposes, with the words that he has over you because he's got a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. And God, just like God saw that widow and that when, and Elisha couldn't see the widow, right? He didn't know what he was walking into, but God can see up ahead and around the corner. And he sees that for your life today. Amen. Number four, our words are a testimony. Hmm. Our life is a story written by God every single day. You know, because Elisha allowed God to speak through him. The widow was able to experience the life-giving power of God. So today, what words are you saying that reflect your heart? God wants to heal broken hearts. He wants to restore relationships. He wants to renew hope. And he wants to bring life to trouble past today. He wants to set you free. The word of God is living and active It says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. That word is sharper than the two-edged sword. It cuts between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and the marrow. It exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. When we take time and we sit down in God's word (laughs) and we ask God to start to speak to us, huh? God is able to come in and share with us things that we maybe didn't even know. There might be some hurts and pains, some stuff we're carrying that we maybe didn't even realize. But when we start to get into the word of God, hallelujah, his word brings hope. It brings life. Hmm. So the four points, your perspective will influence your words. Your words have the power to bring hope and bring life. Your words will only go as far as your opinion of God. And your words are a testimony. Mm. Let's talk about the tongue real quick. Our tongue. You don't see the tongue. Now with, okay, all right. With Sophie, my little nine and a half month old, we have, I can't believe I'm saying this, but we have fun and we'll stick out our tongues at each other. So I'll go, uh, and she'll do that back. And, you know, it's, it's, it's silly, it's fun, but it's my way of interacting, you know, with my daughter. But for the most part, we do not see our tongues, right? But let's read what James has to say about our tongue. And I actually have it for you in the, in the message version today. It says, a bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account. 
but it can accomplish nearly anything or it can destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it, right from the pit of hell. Do your words accomplish, or do they destroy? Mm. Are careless words sometimes said, causing strife, while hurting others and bringing discord? The tongue, the tongue. You know, I'm just going to be transparent with y'all. And um, I love my husband. My husband's name is Paul. And um, for those of you who don't know, he is just a wonderful man of God. We have been married now for four and a half years. And uh, we do have a beautiful baby girl, Sophie, who's nine and a half months. And, um, you know, my... um, our personalities are, very, are, are can be different and can be very similar. And um, I like things to be in order. I like to be able to walk into my office when I get here and everything's in order and, 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 and everything has a place. And before I leave for the day, I try and tidy it up as much as I can because I work better when things are just clean, right? And um, my husband... Hmm. I have to go home with him today. My husband, um, let's just say he's, he's okay to have a paper trail, right? I do everything on my, on my phone or my computer, but Paul loves paper. And so he'll write everything down on little pieces of paper, but then he leaves it everywhere. So at our house, we have a stack of paper here, a paper here, paper here. And to me, it doesn't make sense. I don't understand. But in his mind, oh, it is nice and organized. He's got his little paper trails. And um, so when we first got married, it was like, uh, okay, you know. And I would occasionally come and clean it up. And um, But, you know, since we've had Sophie... And we both are, you know, working part-time and, I mean, part-time, full-time. And um, it's, uh, it's gotten different. Our lifestyle has completely changed. Um, there's laundry piled up. Um, there's dust collecting on pieces of furniture that, you know, frustrates me. His piles of paper now are, are, are they, they get to me. And um, let's just say it's, life is just so different. I don't have my, like, nice and in order world anymore, you know. And people would tell me, when you have kids, that's going to happen. I'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, okay. I need counseling and therapy. Uh, I need to not, whatever. The thoughts I think, ah. Um, so, <laughs> I like to laugh. So, um, but what happens is, you guys, is that, is that it'll, it'll build up. So I might be frustrated over something here, or I, or I might allow myself and my own stinking thinking to go places. And y'all, there's a reason why I'm preaching this message to you this morning, okay? But we're going to leave it there. Um, but my thoughts might be going places, and, and I'll come home, and I can, I, I can feel when it starts to happen. And I can feel when I start getting frustrated and, 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 and so we're getting Sophie and we're getting her to bed, but I've got all these thoughts going on in my head and the bathroom hasn't been cleaned in two weeks and, you know, all this stuff. And I hear the Holy Spirit telling me, be quiet, be quiet. And I'm like, no, no, I don't want to be quiet. So we'll get Sophie to bed and pour a ball. It's like, he'll be sitting there on the couch grading his papers, and all of a sudden, I just let him have it. I don't know if y'all have seen The Matrix, but it's like, he's like, whoa, word, whoa, word, you know, like, ah, word. And, uh, and so those words are just flying at him. And before long, it's not even about the laundry. It's, it's about other things that are going on. And before I know it, sometimes I attack his character. Ugh. If that's a whole nother topic if you're married, but your husband needs respect. Be careful what you say. Because as his wife, my words to him are so important, you guys. Mm. And so quickly, I can speak life and death to my husband. And my husband, he's going to carry that. It's going to wound him. And I've seen it where I've wounded him before because of my words. And then I get so mad that I've done it. 
<laughs> I have a hard time asking forgiveness. So I'll just go in the other room and pout for a little while that I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. And um, eventually, though, I do come back outside. And we do talk about it. Always before we go to bed, y'all. Okay? Always before you go to bed. We talk about it. I tell him I'm sorry. And the thing about my husband is he doesn't get upset. He doesn't get riled. He sits there so nice and peaceful and calm, which makes me even matter. It makes me want to get even like whatever. So, anyways, I'm just saying, when you start letting yourself go by your feelings and your attitude and your thoughts and your perspective, there's no telling where you're going to go with your words. There's no telling how it's going to hurt others, the wounds that are going to happen. And I'll tell you, those wounds, they don't heal automatically. When you say, oh, will you forgive me? It's not like they're just going to heal right then and there. I mean, sometimes, some, I mean, I believe sometimes they can. But sometimes I do know it's a process that you have to walk through. Hmm. A few scriptures I want to share with you. Philippians 4, 8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I would encourage you to get a note card, a little three by five card. Write that scripture on there. Place it on your bathroom. Place it in your car. Place it at your office. And any time you find yourself wanting to go down a path (laughs) of what I call stinking thinking, get out this scripture and say, Lord, help me to think thoughts today that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. And guess what? God's going to come in (laughs) and he's going to see you through. Proverbs 13, three says those who guard their lips will preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Proverbs 15, (laughs) four, Paul says, hmm, yeah, I've spoke rashly. Uh, Proverbs 15, four, the soothing tongue is a tree of life. I love that. But a reverse tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer will turn away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 12.18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Ephesians 4.29, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. You know, if we're going to choose to speak life, we have to be so careful today to guard our heart and to guard our minds. It says in John 10, 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. (laughs) But I have come. That we can have life and have it more abundantly. So those three questions. How many of those words would really matter that you speak? How many of those words would make a difference? And how many of those words spoken sp- spoken speak life into your situations or speak death? Today, I hope you choose to speak words that are life giving life giving into your situation and life giving to others brother norm if you don't mind coming up to the keyboard like i said this is a very simple message but has a lot of application that you can take home with you today and you can think about <clears throat> about a month ago uh Evangel hosted the Beth Moore simulcast. We just had a great time with that. And um, Beth Moore, uh, she uh, prayed a prayer at the ending of the simulcast. And it was just so good. And it's called the symphony prayer. And so today as I was um, asking the Lord how to close and, and what to say, he brought this prayer back to my mind. And it's something that I had printed off and that I had prayed. And I take this prayer and I use it during my devotional time. 
Because what she's done is she's, it's a prayer to God and it has scripture in the prayer. (laughs) She's praying the word over herself while she's praising God. And so what we're going to do is, is I thought instead of me just standing here reading the prayer to you, we're going to put the prayer on the screens and I would like us to all read the prayer together. Can we do that? Let's do that today. And if you want the prayer at the end, we made copies of the prayer. You can pick one up out here at the Connection Center. If you would like to take this and have this during your own devotional time with the Lord. Let's go ahead and read. I, Terry, am your servant. You have chosen me and you are still choosing me. You have equipped me and you are still equipping me. You have lifted me from the abyss and never let me down. Your grace has always been sufficient. And through your astonishing grace, I will abound in every good work. Your word brought me to life and will keep me alive. You baptize me in your spirit and you continue to bathe me in your outpouring. The anointing upon me is real and not counterfeit. Because you are all powerful, I am well able. Because of your death, I am fully alive. Because of your blood, I am clean and pure. Because you are creator, I am creative. Because all treasure of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in you, I am supernaturally wise and knowledgeable in you. I have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because of your mercy, I am enormously loved. I am called to this time, this generation, this unfolding. Let's stand and let's praise the Lord. Let's lift up our words to him. Let's worship him. Let's honor him. If I could have the altar workers to come forward, you know it says in Psalms 19, 14, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God. I do hope that that is your prayer. It could be today that you have had negative words spoken over your life. It could be today that you have struggled with speaking negative words over yourself and your situation. It could be today that you have never believed in the life-giving words of Jesus Christ. And today is a day to believe his word. No longer wrestle with doubt or unbelief, but take a stand today to say, I believe your word and what you say over me. That who is for me, who can be against me? That my God will supply all of my needs. Hallelujah. It could be today that you just need someone here to agree with you and to speak life into a certain situation. What is your perspective? Do you have a God, a God size view of who God is in your life? Today is a day to walk in victory. Hallelujah. I just challenge you, if this is you, if you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you, if you just want prayer, come on down. We're getting ready to worship the Lord. But these altar workers would love the opportunity just to pray with you as we close. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and his church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life. 